Tonight is a very special night. It is uh, almost to the end of our series of invited speakers who speak on the value, the core values of the medical school. And as you know, tonight we're, we're invited someone who represents our value put on diversity. But also, we've got lots of, of sponsors of tonight's event. I think uh, testimony to all the uh, activity that's going on both at the university and the health system. The Office of Diversity and Inclusion, Dr. Nieres was here. He's off to another meeting, but that office uh, has played a role. The OSPA Society has played a role. The uh, Office of Academic Affairs, the Narrative Medicine Group has played a role in sponsoring tonight's event. Again, testimony to how much everyone understands the issues that we face in medicine in terms of the many issues involved in both diversity and bias. Tonight, it is our privilege to have Dr. Augustus White uh, here as our guest speaker. Dr. White is an orthopedic surgeon, and being an internist, I won't hold that against him. <laughs> Even though I had my surgery recently, Nick, and uh, I felt that bad. He attended Stanford Medical School, trained at Yale University Medical Center, <coughs> served in the military in Vietnam, and then practiced orthopedic surgery and was ultimately the chair of orthopedic surgery at one of the Harvard teaching hospitals. He has an illustrious career as an orthopedic surgeon, as a physician dedicated to diversity in healthcare, and perhaps for our medical school, our, our new fledgling medical school, served as one of the society masters of one of the societies at Harvard Medical School. Uh, one of the models that we have copied in terms of the way we are structuring the societies here at our medical school. So as a physician, as a forward-thinking human being, recognizing the needs of all of us, as a medical educator, uh, it is my privilege to introduce Dr. White. Good evening, my fellow human. <laughs> I'm really full of enthusiasm and, and admiration and I'm really honored to be invited to this institution uh, because of its forward-looking reputation and its innovative ideas and its firm commitment to the humanitarian themes of medicine as well as the clinical and scientific themes. So I really appreciate the chance to uh, speak with you. I've already enjoyed some uh, very enriching dialogue with members of your community. And in a sense, I regret that I'm going to take most of the time speaking with you when I really would, would like to be exchanging ideas and hearing from you. But uh, I expect that we will, we will get to do some of that as we go forward. Some months back, the uh, Massachusetts uh, Hospital of Worcester, UMass Medical School at Worcester Medical Center, uh, invited me to be the speaker to celebrate Martin Luther King's birthday. And I was very excited to do that. And uh, I sort of was trying to be cute, I guess, and came up with this, uh, this title to present uh, at that uh, meeting what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would want us to know about healthcare disparities. And I kind of backed into that and stumbled into that. And as it turned out, though, I believe that it is uh, quite appropriate to connect Dr. King and his ideas and ideals to the subject that we are going to be speaking about uh, today. And this quotation, of all the forms of inequality, injustice, and in health, is the most shocking and inhumane. And uh, you don't have to think about that very long to realize you know, doctors and non-doctors and patients, when are we most vulnerable? When are we most easily harmed? When are we most sensitive? When are we most frightened? It's when we're sick. And uh, to engage, to go and seek help, and then to engage in injustice and disparate care, is really quite a threat. And uh, this was a quote I just learned last night at, at, a, at a dinner gathering that uh, Dr. King made this quote when he spoke in, in Mississippi uh, during the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. He was speaking 
to a group of physicians, uh, physicians for humanity, uh, a meeting that he was at and, and, and he made this particular quote. But I think it's a very important and impactful uh, kind of introduction to, to our concerns about uh, healthcare disparity. Um, we don't need to spend much time, I think. I'll give a few examples, but uh, documenting the reality of healthcare disparities. This has been wonderfully done and very thoroughly done in this publication uh, almost 10 years ago now, Unequal Treatment. And this was commissioned by Congress and produced by the Institute of Medicine and reviewed over 600 peer-reviewed articles that sort of categorized and compiled all of the realities of healthcare disparities. But uh, even so, I think it's worth spending some time just to review the list. And you may want to add to this list, and I wouldn't disagree, uh, but here are 13 uh, African Americans, the Appalachian poor, also you can think of us as poor whites, uh, in addition to the imperfuity uh, of, their, of their existence, they also have a different culture in, in many ways. Asian Americans, uh, the elderly, gays, lesbians, bisexuals, and transgender individuals, immigrants, Latinos, Native Americans, obese people, people living with disabilities, some religious groups, women, and not just minority women, all women uh, experience health care disparities, and prisons. Now, how many people believe in the Ten Commandments? Okay. How many people believe in the Eleventh Commandment? Okay. Well, now you're going to learn about the Eleventh Commandment. You didn't learn this in Sunday school. Well, as it turns out, when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai with the tablets, had the commandments on it. He slipped and fell. <laughs> the tablet hit one of the stones and cracked. And part of it slid off down the mountainside. Never to be found again. But I know what was on it. <laughs> and it was the 11th commandment. And the 11th commandment said, Thou shalt not commit isms. <laughs> so, uh, here's one ism, and we're going to say a lot about this isms, but all the 13 isms, if you will, are very, very important. But I mentioned this one because I was thrilled to see this as I was watching the World Cup competition of women's uh, soccer. And here's this, this in, in, the, in the opening ceremony, this, you may have seen this on the television, but this, this is what they presented. Here are both teams uh, in Sweden and China. And the referees, you can see people of color among the referees and the players. And this is an international global event. This is a World Cup soccer, the most popular sport in the world. And there was good reason to get together and get organized and present this as part of the opening ceremony. I just think that's significant and I'm happy to be able to share that. And it represents progress. Just a few examples, again, this is all well documented, but just to get a flavor of what we're talking about. Uh, among African -Ameri Americans, a few health care disparities. Uh, African Americans receive fewer kidney and liver transplants. With diabetes, they are much more likely to have amputations than others. And with prostate cancer, for example, castrations are much more common and prevalent in African Americans. Among all women, as compared with men, experiencing fewer joint replacements where indications are present, less medication following heart attack, and women heart attack patients take more time to get to the emergency room to the hospital than males. What about Hispanics? Less pain medication for major fractures. Happily, a, a couple of my orthopedic. Uh, Colleagues said hello right before the lecture. And uh, believe it or not, individuals with fresh long bone fractures in Southern California, if they were Hispanic, it, 
coming to the emergency room, obviously an easy diagnosis to make, not very controversial, and extremely painful situation. <coughs> Latino patients received 50% less narcotic medication for that acute emergency room encounter than did others. And it was such a shocking situation that the study, very similar study, was done in Atlanta, this time looking at African-American males coming into the emergency room with a fresh long bone fracture. And they received 50% less chance of receiving narcotic medication as a treatment for that condition. So there are many, many, many examples. I've just selected a few. Uh, Latinos get less basic recommended services, such as flu vaccines and other preventive medical uh, recommendations. Well, another way to look at it, this lady is courageous to say, okay, doc, give it to me straight. What's wrong with you? Well, there you see the answer. You're not a white man. Uh, but that's a, that's a sobering reality. And uh, she's about to receive disparate care. At least she's at risk for receiving disparate care. And if you think about it, you may want to put a few more layers on it. You could say, well, she's obese, isn't she? So that's another is another bias that's likely to give her uh, less quality of care. And she, maybe she's elderly. So maybe she's in that category. And maybe that's another error that she might experience. And supposing she's a lesbian. Here again, she may be likely to get the spirit of care for being in that group. I think we could easily spend the whole afternoon, the whole lecture on this particular slide. And it comes from a book which I recommend strongly to you called Doing Race. And it's published, it comes out of Stanford, the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, which is an eclectic Center at Stanford that brings in historians, political scientists, psychologists, sociologists, literature professors, and they study together at the professorial and work together at the professorial level, at the graduate student level, at the undergraduate level, and they've been working for a number of years. They produced a book called Doing Race. And it's a compilation of 21 essays, most of which have emanated from these scholars. And it's, it's not politicized, it, it's a scholarship around these issues. And this, in some ways, is a summary of it. And I'd just like to talk a little bit about this, because I think it's, it's important. I, what, what we want to do, and I really should have said this earlier in the lecture, uh, maybe your introductory handout says about this. But I'm not here to accuse people, try to make people feel guilty, uh, and to beat up on our past errors. But we need to be, and we want to be realistic, so I want to put as much on the table that's realistic for us to chew on and think about and be realistic about. So that's, that's my mission. And one of the powerful themes is racism, which is representative of other isms, none of which are desirable, all of which we want to strive to eliminate. And I'm hoping at the end of the talk, if just one or two or three or few of you will, will, will do something different in your sphere of influence uh, as you think about the things that we're going to be discussing and think about what you can do to, to change these realities and make them different. So let's talk a little bit about the racial iceberg. Um, let's focus on that boat which is running into the top of the iceberg. And what percentage of the iceberg is above the water? Usually 10%, right? And the rest of it, the other 90% is down underneath the surface. So the racial encounters that we see, we can think of as being 10% of that iceberg that's above the water, and we have these racial encounters. But then, let's look at the racial iceberg. It goes way down in the water, and at the bottom it says, that's the sea of history. And to me, this was very powerful, and I have to admit, I had not thought about it to this extent. By that I mean all of the things in that sea of history realistically impact upon that collision, that racial incident that's occurring at the 10% of the iceberg above the water. Slavery. 
it's, it's, it's gone. It it's exists in different forms still somewhere, but it's not what it was. But it impacts on a day-to-day -day basis on the realities that we are addressing and dealing with. Iran-Contra, the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Monroe Doctrine actually impacts on our day-to-day -day realities around issues of race. Colonialism impacts on our race issues. Jim Crow, obviously. The Civil War, obviously. Japanese internment, obviously. Immigration, obviously. All of these things are part of an ongoing racial environment. And that impacts on the problems that we have, and that impacts on healthcare disparities. And this is just, to, as I said, try to be realistic about the magnitude and the uh, seriousness of the problem and the inertia in the system that we need to overcome. So, this comes from the book. By the way, it's edited by Marcus and Moya. It's published by Norton Press. But just to give you a little more of a flavor, they define race. Let's just go through this definition of race. Race is a doing. The title of the book, as we said, is Doing Race. Race is a doing, a dynamic set of historically derived and institutionalized ideas and practices that sorts people into ethnic groups according to perceived physical and behavioral human characteristics that are often imagined to be negative, innate, and shared. It associates differential value, power, and privilege with these characteristics, establishes a hierarchy among the different groups, and confers opportunity accordingly. So that's doing race. And uh, I would argue that anywhere in the world you can find two distinctly different groups of people, the high probability is that one group will be beating up on the other and discriminating and mistreating and exploiting the other. So let's just run through a few, just, just to list doing race. And they suggest that we're doing race in all of these categories. Employment, just to pick, you pick the study, they took a whole bunch of uh, resumes and they put the resumes were equal in their attractiveness and their, their competencies. And they put African American names on, on the top of one group, and Caucasian names on the top of the other group, and sent them out for applications and interviews. Tremendous disparity of difference in terms of the African American names being invited for interviews. Housing. Uh, we are as segregated in terms of housing in this country as we have ever been, and we are almost totally segregated in terms of housing. And I'll come back to that a little bit. Schooling, we see Gloria Darling Hammond has published extensively about the tremendous inequities in the quality of education that uh, some of our citizens have experienced. Medicine, that's the main topic of our discussion today. The justice system. Tremendous differences in, in uh, if you uh, murder a white person, the chances of re receiving the death sentence is substantially greater than if you murder a black person, uh, if you're black. Uh, and many other examples there, uh, very present. In sports, if you're a white referee, you call more fouls on black players. If you're a black referee, you call more fouls on, black, on white players and many other examples of discrimination in sports. In the media, a recent study looked at 900 movies in the U.S., produced in the U.S., starting with when we didn't have, when we just had movies without sound. And uh, these movies were evaluated, looking for how Arabs were depicted. Were they depicted positively? Were they depicted negatively, or were they depicted neutral? About 12 of these movies showed that they were positively depicted. Uh, 18 and 19, as I recall, showed that they were neutral. The other 580 plus were negative. And there's so many examples of these kinds of things that could be pointed out. So now, I said we go back to housing. I just want to tell a unique story about housing. 
this black family did indeed move into a rather upscale neighborhood. And uh, they moved in, things were as usual. And, uh, but the neighbor of this black family uh, began to escalate and put new value on this property. We did extensive landscaping. And the black guy said, okay, well, we'll do the same thing. So he did the same thing. And uh, then the, the white guy uh, had a beautiful, put in a beautiful swimming pool in his house. The black guy said, okay, we'll do the same thing. And uh, then a few more months went by, and uh, the, the, the white neighbor bought this very upscale, expensive Italian car. The black guy said, he told his wife, he said, I've had enough of this. I'm going to put it into it. I'll be right back. I'm going next door and put it into it. So he went next door and he knocked, up, knocked on the door. And his white neighbor came to the door and he said, look, tired of this competition. What you need to know is you can never keep up with me. So you might as well give up. You can never keep up with me because I do not live next door to any black people. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the mechanism? How, how do some of these things happen? Uh, well, some of the encounters in the doctor-patient relationship, the caregiver-patient relationship, really involve conscious and unconscious bias, and they involve stereotyping, and this interferes with the quality and accuracy of the communication. And this is the beginning. So we tell our medical students, communication is the first procedure uh, in medicine. Communication is to be as accurate and as on the mark as, as possible. And uh, interestingly, if you, if you haven't done this and you're interested in the privacy of your own study, you can go on the internet and take uh, Dr. Banaji's implicit association test. And you can go in and what you do is, is you do a rapid fire response to a number of circumstances. You can determine whether you have gender bias or racial bias or, or age bias. A variety of tests you can do. And I, I recommend that you do this. It could be interesting to see. It just, in a sense, tells us a lot of biases we think we don't have. This test would suggest that unconsciously we, we do. Um, and here's a study that used this test uh, in our conversation. This is uh, several people that have been to my colleague, Dr. Bettencourt, in Boston. And his close uh, working colleague is Dr. Alex Green. And Dr. Green did a study in which he he uh, asked a group of residents who agreed to participate in this experiment, uh, are you biased against African Americans? And he recorded how they responded. And a large group said, no, I'm not. And then he gave all of them this implicit association test, uh, Professor Bernardi's test. And some of them said, oh, you are. You do have unconscious bias. He then uh, gave them a theoretical clinical situation where they were evaluated a number of patients and the medical indications were for anticoagulation therapy. And these were African American patients. And a number of these uh, individuals who reported no biases against uh, African Americans but showed on this IAT test that they had biases, did not give the proper care, did not anticoagulate these patients who clearly had uh, clinical indications for anticoagulation. So he sort of demonstrated in this experimental setting unconscious bias in healthcare in this particular study. <clears throat> so just a couple of other parts of reality. This is an extensive study done by the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. But they looked at over a period between 2003-2006, African American patients, Asian American patients, and Hispanic patients, and they noticed that there's a 30.6% overage in healthcare costs or looking after these particular patients. So, I'd like to spend a little bit of time, again, trying to put everything on the table on what I call doctor stressors. And I can tell you right now, there's about six slides. And uh, I'd like to go through it, I won't talk on it, but I think it's relevant. Uh, error prevention, remember some years back, the Institute of Medicine pointed out a number of errors that are prevalent in medical practice. Malpractice is always a potential stressor for physician. Sleep deprivation, we read a lot about, hear a lot about. The American Board of Internal Medicine recently uh, did a review uh, and uh, 
talk about professionalism enhancement. They, they raise the bar for what they consider professional responsibilities. That is, not only looking out and protecting as well as possible our own individual patients, but that we ought to be out in society working to improve and change things that are in the best interest of the health care of our patients. The American College of Surgeons, maybe two or three years ago now, reported 40% burnout among the surgeons and 30% had depression. Uh, personal financial debt, graduating from medical school, of course, and doing substantial debt. Uh, people are asking us to see more patients sooner, quicker. Patient throughput. Conflict of interest issues, we've heard a lot about in recent years. Uh, doctors have been overly uh, entertained, overly uh, taken care of, overly paid for lecturing and advising uh, the use of various medications. And this has certainly caused uh, stress as well. More teaching time than required. The deans want us to do more teaching than we can. Um, more, keeping abreast of knowledge. This one I like. For a general practitioner to keep up with the literature, he or she needs to read only 19 articles per day, 365 days a year. Uh, so that is a stressor. And struggle for reimbursement. Interacting with insurance after one does the work to take care of the patient, to provide the care, one then has to engage, negotiate, hassle, do whatever to, to uh, be paid by the insurance company. And this is equivalent to about $85,000 per year for a full time doctor, according to this particular study in the Journal of Health Affairs. Uh, this one surprised me. Violence in health facilities are four times as common as in other private sector industries. Violence, that was, that was quite a shock. So, so there are plenty of doctor stresses around. Operating costs are rising faster than referrals. Reimbursements are declining. Collecting from self-paid patients is, is difficult and challenging. Uncertain in Medicare rates are present. You're hearing a lot about electronic health records. But it takes a lot of time and energy and attention to A, decide and choose health care records, what system one is going to use, and then to implement those records. Obviously, uh, another stressful responsibility. And then along comes some guy who said, not only that, you're racist. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we going to do? <laughs> it, it, is, it is a challenge. Uh, okay. Well, let's, uh, let's look at some of the things, though. I uh, had an opportunity with the help of one of my orthopedic colleagues to, uh, to go kind of a, it wasn't a meta-analysis, but to look through the literature for a possible solution. And I'd just like to share some of those, because as, as you said, I'm hoping that, that uh, you know, at, at the end of this day, you'll, you'll think a little differently about this and maybe act in some way that suits your your, your style suits your uh, sphere of influence and things that you might feel you can do well. But here are just some general guidelines. And we, we thought that uh, we sort of added all these things up and there were over 100 suggestions of different things that we can do. I'll just offer a few here now. Uh, certainly, and, and this is the beginning, it's the first time I raise this, but the equation is doctor and patient. And it's important, I believe, that lay patients understand uh, the realities, or some of them at least, of, of healthcare disparities, because the patient can help the doctor to help them better if, if they have some knowledge and understanding and some ideas about how to improve the communications and improve the quality of care they may receive. So health literacy is, is, is certainly one of those examples. Uh, educate the caregivers. Now, of course, there are many things that can be done to educate the caregivers, and much of what's going on, I think, in our, in this medical school uh, does that and, and will mitigate toward more equitable care, in, in my opinion. And we'll talk about some of these, but, but not all of them. Uh, increased diversity of caregivers. We certainly talked about that this afternoon, and we had a living example of that, and I, I found that a very, very inspiring and interesting uh, engagement. Increase the diversity of the caregivers. And we'll say a little bit about that. I know uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Fonari 
hope they about many things about the school and the, the values, the ten essential values. Uh, very impressive and very good to see right on top of the table, right at the beginning, as a commitment to the institution. I think that's most admirable, and I don't think many institutions have that so much up front. I think other schools are doing it, but here it's an upfront commitment. It's very inspiring. And I'll just say just not much, but just a little bit about diversity uh, in, in that context, but there are other values that are important as well. UC Davis study is, is quite reassuring, in my opinion. This was done back in 1997, but they looked at students, they compared students who had been accepted to the school on an affirmative action program, right on front, clear, affirmative action, and uh, students who were routinely accepted, the way they always accepted their students, and then they followed these along. Uh, and what did they notice? There was a 94% graduation rate of the affirmative action students and 97 rate for the others. That's a pretty minor difference in my opinion. The other thing, more important, the specialization rates were the same in both groups. The residency performances were the same in both groups. The honors received were the same in both groups. And I think that's a reassuring uh, report. And it's good to know that, that uh, one can develop uh, an affirmative action program and produce those kinds of results. Uh, professionalism, I already mentioned. This was reported in Lancet in 2002. But as I said, basically raising the bar for our responsibility as professionals in the new millennium to our patients one-on-one uh, -on -one versus looking at societal issues as well. Uh, so the essence includes societal responsibility. Another suggestion, the, the community-based efforts seem to have traction, although I, I must admit, as far as I know, in looking in the literature, you know, I'm not claiming to be up to date on a day-to-day, -day, a week-to-week -week basis, but so far, many of the educational programs have been able to change attitudes and ideas and behavior to some degree on the part of caregivers, but so far there's not an evidence basis of any educational program that actually changes patient outcomes. So we still have a real challenge to be as innovative as to try to find ways and to make sure we do the research so that we do come upon something that really works and changes outcomes. We'll be able to uh, uh, develop that more thoroughly. Uh, we can work to leverage government spends a lot of money uh, on patient care if we can look at ways to, to have that leverage and that, uh, that use of resources address and question uh, health care disparities elimination. I think that's very helpful. And I don't think we should allow anybody to talk about health care quality without talking about eliminating health care disparities. How can you have quality health care when, when 13 groups of individuals are documented to be experiencing disparate care? So when we say quality, that must include attention to diminishing and eliminating health care disparities. Uh, New Jersey, the only state in the union that requires evidence of culturally competent care education to get one's initial license to practice medicine or to renew one's license to practice medicine. That's pretty good. That's pretty serious. Only, time, only state so far has done that. Uh, Arizona made a proposal that didn't pass. California has a law that says if you do a continuing medical education course for graduate physicians, you must include some uh, attention to and some uh, work and opportunities in healthcare disparities in the nation. Uh, Verizon, this one is unique. Verizon Corporation, when it chooses, as a cor corporation, when it chooses the insurance that it will buy and <coughs> contract for its employees, they say, we want to know what you're doing. Tell us what you're doing to guarantee equitable care. I think that's a tremendous step. And I think more corporations and more people can call up their personnel department and say, you know, what do you guys do to make sure your insurance company, our insurance company, is doing things to try to provide equitable care. So to me, that's a tremendous leverage point. And Verizon 
received an award for, for disparate care. I don't know if it's because of this, but I do know that they receive special attention. And there is a group of corporations that are looking at and care about health care disparities. Uh, what else can we do? We can thoroughly address the AC GME cultural competency requirements of our residents and train them. It's in the requirements for training. It should be part of that curriculum. Uh, so we should make sure we address that. And for our medical students, there are two directives. Uh, one is that we should know something about the cultures of patients that, predominant, that represent predominant parts of our patient population. Something about their cultures. Some understanding of their cultures. And then directive number 22 uh, <coughs> says that students must know something about their own bias. They should study, it should be self-awareness, self-examination to medical students to know and understand what biases they may have so that that can be kind of a yellow light and they begin to do something about trying to change those biases or at least make certain that when they see patients that one knows that, that one has biases against an obese, obese patients, that obese patients come into your office and you walk into the examining room uh, to encounter an obese patient, you want to turn on a yellow light and say, well, let me make sure that I don't uh, give this person secondary uh, not good care. Uh, these class standards represent kind of a cookbook. If you do everything in this recommended by the government, uh, you will improve the uh, tendency uh, to have disparate care. And it says things like, uh, you know, have things in your office represent something. If you have a, a, a patient population with large and two old patients, maybe some of the artwork in your office could look uh, familiar, could be art that represents some the magazines on your waiting room table that have some magazines in Spanish, etc. But there are many specific examples in this class guidelines that can be helpful. Um, Dr. Fanari asked me to say a little bit about narratives and writing and how writing might have affected uh, some of my development or activities. And I'll, I'll do that. I'll mention several things. And uh, it turns out that when I knew I was going to go to Vietnam, I started keeping a journal, maybe about six months before I went. And during the year that I was there working as a combat surgeon uh, in kind of a mass unit, uh, I call it sitting at the delta of a river of blood, watching the blood flow by for a year, do what you can to spend the time with the blood. But uh, I kept the journal through the time that I was in Vietnam and also for about six months after. And I think it helped me, and I'll give you a few examples, several examples. It helped me very specifically to, to reflect on what I was doing, to put things that I was doing in perspective. And I, you know, I didn't write 100% every night, but close to it. And reflecting on thoughts, ideas, experience. And one of the things that, that, that I experienced and maybe it would have happened if I hadn't written about it, but in writing about it, it really, it really uh, focused the reality of what it happened. And uh, the way it worked in, in the mass unit that we were in was that helicopters would come in at any hour and land right outside what we developed uh, as a reception area. And there might be one wounded soldier, or there might be six, or eight, or ten. And there might be one or two or three helicopters. And they would bring them in immediately, and we had a, a bunch of stretchers that were all lined up in this concert that is what the hospital was. And we, the surgeons and nurses, would, I sort of thought of it as attacking, would this, this descend upon these patients and begin to rigorously do what we were trained to do, which is to check their airway, make sure the airway is available, check the status of their hemorrhage, uh, stop whatever hemorrhage is, is, is going on, get in an IV, make a triage decision as to what x-rays are uh, needed, bam, 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 as fast as you possibly can to get to as many people and take care of them before they go to the next stage, which might be too late. And uh, when I first got there, needless to say, I didn't do that with the facility and efficiency and rapidity that I needed to. Uh, but with time and experience, I did. And I could do it fast. I could get there, do everything I needed to do, make the decision, triage satisfactory. One day I went in and I did this, and there was a young man who had been hit with a, with a 
to the a rocket that didn't detonate, but it was, it was a very powerful uh, hit in his body, tremendous. And uh, I'm, I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to do, and he said, he said, Doc, am I going to be all right? I said, yeah, you're going to be all right. And we'll get you in, in you know, get him pretty fine. And I kept doing all the things I was supposed to do. We got him in, we triaged him, but he didn't make it. And I realized, and I wrote in the journal, I realized, I thought about it. You know, you got to do all these IVs, you got to do all this stuff, but realize that all too frequently, you're going to be the last human being that your patient talks to. And you can't just blow it off. You got to spend, you got to relate, you got to spend some time to re relate to that patient as an individual and do all the other stuff that you need to do. But it was, it was just, it was clear, it was very real. Um, so that, I think, writing helped to capsulize that and get that message to me loud and clear. Um, the other example is uh, uh, when I talk about Vietnam, I say that the heroes in Vietnam were the helicopter pilots. And just very briefly, because they were very skilled, and they were very brave and very courageous, and they would go in and get people and bring them to us. Soon after they were hit, they weren't afraid to go into dangerous areas that had just recently been in firefights and those kinds of things. Uh, and the nurses, the nurses were the other people. All of the nurses who went to Vietnam, whether they were in the military to begin with or not, were volunteers. You were not sent as a nurse to Vietnam unless you volunteered. But many nurses volunteered to join the services in order to come to serve. And what, again, in, in observing and thinking about things and, and, and writing, what I realized, again, that we, even though I made the point of talking to this trooper in the future, I'm not, not talking to this trooper, uh, most of our time was spent greeting wounds and doing the surgery. And we didn't do a whole lot of making rounds and you know, talking to patients on, on the rounds, but we, we even operated them day in and day out. But who was doing that? Was the nurses and who was listening to you know the, the fear and the woe and, and the pain and, and the tragedy of uh, of all these patients with these horrible injuries were the nurses. You know, who was holding their hand? Who was giving them the compassion? And uh, and how did they survive? The nurses. So I think they were heroes. I think they they gave the compassion that was needed in addition to stopping the bleeding and degrading the wounds. These these patients needed support. They needed help. And nurses had no small degree of post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, you know, as a result of that. But they, they, they did it. It wasn't so well known at, at, at that time. But anyway, that was just another reality that, that helped me to focus uh, based on some of my interest in writing. And the last one I'll do, very brief, and I'm going to call it Pier Negro. Uh, I experienced this, but Vietnam was 1966. Uh, I think I was the only author, the only surgeon, African American surgeon in Vietnam, I think. But I was fully trained. I just finished my residence. I was fully trained. And I was like a racehorse. You know, I had all this, all this stuff, and I, was, I just couldn't wait to, to get it. So, I, and it was all shot in my mind. I was studying the boards, and so, uh, you know, I was, I was fine. Uh, but I was a pure Negro. My White medical colleagues had seen us on the athletic field. They'd seen us in entertainment. But they never had us as a peer. And believe me, there's a lot of resentment. A lot of resentment. Uh, because sometimes, since I was the only trained orthopedics, and many times I would have to change what they did. I would have to correct what they did. Because they weren't trained orthopedics. And uh, maybe I didn't do it with enough humility. I certainly was not arrogant. But anyway, there was a tremendous resentment, and I was able to write about that, I was able to understand that, I was able to deal with that and, and, and analyze it. But, uh, so those are some examples uh, uh, in Fenari. I hope, uh, I hope I met the assignment editor. Uh, so, okay, yeah, So, and now the other thing, back to the, now this book that we were just talking about, uh, one of the themes of that book is our common humanity. And I hope that you got the little handout and we try to help to put that in perspective a little bit. The thread of humanity is in all of this. 
and how it extends even beyond the medical setting. And this wonderful quote I just happened to stumble upon from Desmond Tutu, and I think it says so much about the doctor-patient relationship. And it's, my humanity is bound up in yours, for we can only be human together. And I think one of the ways to get past this healthcare disparity is as we as physicians try to somehow relate and connect with the humanity of our patients. Because it's there. And we are trained. We are trained and we are experienced to be aware and to be sophisticated and knowledgeable about our common humanity. Because we know that uh, we know what people are under the skin. We know how people work. We know something about how their brains work and their bodies work. And, and we understand what they're like as human beings. And we spend a lot of time studying that. So we ought to be able to connect with the humanity of our patients. And it's an important thing. And as we said, the patient has an opportunity and a responsibility to try to connect with the humanity of their caregivers as well. So let me just run through a few suggestions here uh, for caregivers. We'll move along fast. But first of all, believe that biases exist. Now, I, I bet there's some of you right now who don't believe that, you know, that they're biases. Which is, you have a right to your opinion. But, but try to believe. The reality is that these biases do exist. They're conscious and they're unconscious. Uh, believe that we can improve. We can change. We can do better. I really think that we can. If we make the effort, we can do better. And review these cost standards as some guidelines. If you want to take kind of a cookbook approach, that's fine. You can do some good things if you follow those cost guidelines. Um, explore self-awareness. Um, explore your own box. Maybe you can start with the IAT test, implicit association test, or talk with a friend. Just think about it and say, okay, yeah, maybe I am biased against gay people. Or maybe I am biased against elderly people. Or maybe I am biased against disabled people. So let me, okay, I'm human, but let, let me change that. Let me think about that, and next time I see a patient, we make sure I give them good care. If we practice evidence-based medicine, uh, that could be another cookbook approach. If, you, if every patient you take care of, every patient you take care of, you practice evidence-based medicine, you're going to be fine. You're not going to have any disparate care uh, with, with those patients. Humanize our patients and relate to that humanity as best we can. Simplistic way to think about it. <coughs> So-called double F criteria. Treat patients as family or friends. You know, just how would you treat this patient as your friend? Say, you know, do your best. The teach-back mechanism is... <coughs> teach-back mechanism is very helpful. At the end of the visit, Take a minute and say, you know, Ms. Jones, what do you understand about what's, what your condition is, what's wrong, and what we're going to do to try to help you? Just tell me how you understand it. And she gets it right. Great. That's, that, that's right. Thank you. And uh, she forgets something. She said, well, now, remember we said we were also going to do thing A and thing B. And, uh, so now tell me how, how do you understand it. So if you do that, it's a wonderful double check. And a lot of times we may think we're communicating and we didn't quite hit it. But if you do that teach back, that, that can be helpful. Um, okay. Now, what happens if you have a you walk into the room and you've been there a couple of minutes and you start it and all of a sudden the patient's angry? They say, Doc, haven't you ever taken care of an Asian patient before? Why are you I, why are you treating this way? You're not listening to me. You don't you know respect me. And you know what 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 why are you doing? This? So, uh, whatever the confrontation may be, what can you do? And this is kind of a first aid approach, but I think it I think it can be helpful. Step back and relax and apologize without making excuses. Say, I'm sorry. And express your intent to give good care. And say, I, I, want to, I want to take care of you. I want to give you good care. Let's see if we can work together to go forward. And sometimes that will solve the situation right away, and other times it won't. But this is just a recommendation. Um, okay, a few more suggestions for caregivers, and we're finishing up soon here. Treat all patients with, with respect. And uh, I tell my kids and so forth is to treat all people with respect. But certainly, treat patients with respect. And aspire to patient centered care is very important. Again, establish diversity in both the clinical staff and the support staff. I think it's important in both venues. So, 
In summary, we've, uh, we have a formidable national problem. And it's in our best interest, in the best interest of patients, in the best interest of our communities, the best interest of our country to, to address those problems. And we must improve them. And one of the themes, one of the ways, one of the theories, one of the practices is to try to think of ourselves as knowledgeable about humanity and, and try to relate to the humanity uh, of our patients. Here, back in 19... Uh, 62 or 63 as a house officer, I somehow had the privilege of attending breakfast with Dr. King. And I uh, didn't really speak with him very much, but it was very clear that I was in the presence of, of a great, great human being, a very wonderful humanitarian. I'm the tall, naive looking guy in the back row here. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that Dr. King would want us to continue to strive to be a more humane society and for doctors, nurses, and others to be humanitarian role models. Be well, respectfully submitting. Thank you. Thank you. Responsibility to reduce uh, disparities in care, which I think everyone would acknowledge exists. What what is your what are your thoughts about what we can do at a more global societal level uh, to uh, deal with disparities in healthcare? Well, I think that's a, that's a very important issue and question, and uh, I think we are a ways away from. I think one of the first steps is to, uh, right now, I think the lay public is, is almost oblivious to this, uh, or at least, at best, not very well aware. And I'm not sure why. Uh, we've, we've, we've tried to do that in, in different 
ways, not terribly well organized maybe, but we tried to do that. And the challenge just doesn't seem to be right. But what I'm referring to now is the media. I think the mechanism for doing that is somehow through the media. But right now, the media has a very modest interest in healthcare disparities. But I think sooner or later, that will change. And as the public becomes more aware, I think there can be more proactive organizations and, and more changes. Uh, the health care reform bill has a little bit in there, uh, not so much maybe for education, but for improvement. And that is, uh, at NIH, there's a center for minority health and health disparities. There was a center. And it was, its, its mission was to address just what we've been talking about today, healthcare disparities. That center, as part of the bill, was elevated to an institute, which means that's what there's a heart institute, there's a cancer institute, now there's a healthcare disparities institute. Uh, it still has precious little staff and financial resources compared to the other institutes. In fact, uh, Dr. Sullivan and others, Dr. Lee Sullivan has Secretary of Health under Bush team, with other colleagues, and is, is working to try to say, uh, Let's distribute these funds in a way that this institute now has the leverage to, be, to make a difference. So I think that's one thing that helps. I think to have more people to ensure it helps. And one thing I didn't mention in the talk, and I should have mentioned it, and that is obviously if you don't have access, and that's purely a financial insurance issue, if you can't even get to the doctor, obviously you're not going to have good health care. Uh, and I think by having more coverage, more people covered, uh, th that access problem will be the uh, So I think we're evolving. I think we're making progress. I, I think in the medical world, I think there are more and more schools that are that are engaged here. And, uh, and I'm not I'm not trying to flatter you or anything like that. But I have I've visited a number of medical schools, and none have had the kind of turnout that we have here today. And uh, I think that's commensurate with you have clearly defined mission statements and your commitment to these things. But, but I think more and more schools will get involved, they'll become more involved, but it needs to be an institutionalized commitment. Healthcare disparity, education, we like to say is just as important as physiology. What are you doing for physiology? From A to Z, do it for healthcare disparities, or at least do it for cultural complementary education. And uh, you know, I think few schools or anywhere near that. So even though we're not oblivious, as I think the lay public is, uh, we in medicine could be more engaged and more aware of these things as, as well. But uh, yeah, clearly uh, this has been a very uh, inspiring uh, turnout. And uh, I know that's due to some good salesmanship and all. And, uh, but I'm, I'm really inspired, and, and that's it. Uh, I'm not trying to sell anything, but I'm very enthusiastic and respectful of the innovative changes that, that, that your school represents. I think they really make great sense, and I'm very happy to be exposed to that.